those of you who were here for Five Ashes Part One, I think amazed and patient uh, and thank God for the people who lived through this with his parents, and now he lives through it with me. Yeah, I know it's a horror story. <laughs> But in any case, uh, let's give Jeffrey a hand. And let's give a part two of my message. I'm over here. Let me turn this thing on. Is it on? It's got to turn green. Yeah. It is green. Is it green? Okay. Thank you very much for coming, ladies and gentlemen. First thing I, I'd like to say is that ever since I've worked with Wayne, I've discovered that he's a class A class. He has encouraged me, and it's because of him that I, I've been able to do this. And uh, thank you thank very you. much, Wayne. Well, thank you. Well, as you can see, the title is Live Ashes. Why did I name it Live Ashes? The main reason was because of my visit to Auschwitz in 1998. Uh, I went to Auschwitz one. And then I went to Auschwitz II, where my father was deported to. It's, it's, it's called Birkenau. It's about three kilometers from Auschwitz I, the original Auschwitz. It's about a one and a half mile walk. But anyway, so when I was at Auschwitz II, where my father was, I went where the gas chambers and the crematory were. And they're all blown up so you can't see anything. It's, it's just rubble. But off to the side, there was a pit that, that was cordoned off. And that was where the ashes were dumped. So though it was cordoned off, I walked on it. And I stood on it. And I said to God, which I wasn't on speaking terms with at the time. Uh, I would demand to have that you give me what was killed here, the energy, the creativity, the intellect. And I suppose that in a way, the Lord has answered me. <clears throat> I have had a few close calls that I was saved from. And when I look back at, at my life, there are so many close calls. But of course, because of what my parents went through, <clears throat> I was not happy with God. You know, it was like, Somebody I really didn't want to know. For a long time, for many decades, uh, so I stood there on those ashes and I demanded all of that. And I realized that I was going a little nuts, you know, but Auschwitz is not a place where you go sane. Uh, One of the first things that I looked at when I walked into Birkenau was, how could I escape from here? And I looked around, and there was no escape. It was impossible to escape that place. In fact, I was reading some history about it, and uh, there was a a large area around Auschwitz that if you got too close to Auschwitz, you would go through the process anyway because they didn't want anybody to know what was going on there. 
So they, they kill Germans, they kill Poles, you know, that. So that's where I, I got the name Live Ashes from, that pit with all the ashes in it. I began thinking about when I went back to my hotel in Krakow, I began thinking about what if those people live? What if those people had children? What would they have become? Would they have become scientists, teachers, psychologists, philosophers, politicians? Maybe they would have created something in medicine or in pharmaceuticals that would help mankind in general. So that first night after Auschwitz in my hotel in Krakow, I don't think that I was quite sane that night, but uh, for good reason. Now, I have two, two gizmos here that I have to operate. I have to operate the microphone and this thing over here. So let me try. I have to hit that, right? It doesn't work. It's, it's not doing it, Kristen. So anyway, so uh, there it is. Okay. Oświęci. Oświęcim is the Polish name for Auschwitz. It was called Auschwitz because until after World War I, it was controlled by the Austro-Hungary Empire, so it was its German name, Auschwitz. Birkenau in Polish is Brzezinka. I was born in the city of Lodz, right there which is about 160 kilometers from Warsaw. 100 miles from Warsaw. Lodz was known as Poland's second largest city. It became a large city in the mid 1800s where, where Lodz became a textile industry and a railroad hub. And it was compared to Manchester in England. It was the Manchester of Eastern Europe. It, it, it had a population of approximately 200,000 to 230,000 Jews that were mainly involved in the textile industry. It was Poland's second largest ghetto next to Warsaw, and that's where both my parents were. You know, it's, it's kind of interesting that in junior high school, I decided that my heroes were James Bond and Gandhi. You know, every guy can understand why I would like James Bond. <laughs> when it came to Gandhi, it took me a little while to realize the implications of his wardrobe. But, uh, it also indicated the dichotomy of my mind. On the one hand, I searched for answers. Why did this happen? How did this happen? How can human beings do this to other human beings? And I'm not talking only about Nazis against Jews because they killed a lot of people, homosexuals, communists, social, anybody who didn't agree with them, they killed in some way, shape, or form. So, so anyway, uh, my father completed his compulsory military service in Poland in 1937, but when the war began, or it was coming, he was called back into the Polish army in 1939, and Germany invaded Poland on September 1 of 1939, and the war was on. 
make a long story short, my father was captured. He was, uh, uh, and he was imprisoned in a POW camp in Czechoslovakia until January of 1940, where he came back to Lodge just in time for the Lodge ghetto to be created and closed. Now, let me emphasize, let me emphasize this. When we think of a ghetto in this country, what do we think of is a poor area of town where certain people live you know, like a black ghetto. This was a Jewish ghetto, but it really wasn't a ghetto because they were forced into that part of town and then it, it was blocked off from the Polish sector. So it was a prison. It was guarded by 213 sentry posts. It was walled off. They had brick walls, they had barbed wire. Just to give you an idea, well, let's see if this is going to work now. This was the size. This was the size of the ghetto. Let me get this thing out, because I'm told that if I don't speak into this, you can't hear me very well. This was the size of the ghetto. There were about at its height, there were 260,000 people in there. At its height, there was 260,000 people in there. This is a picture of the leader, the Jewish leader, the Jewish leader of the uh, Lodz ghetto was Rumkowski. He's right here. And he's talking to Himmler, who was the Gestapo and SS chief. This is, this is Rumkowski, and this is Hans Bibel. Hans Bibel's job was, uh, he, he was like the Oscar Schindler of the Lodge Ghetto, but he was no Oscar Schindler. At the end of the war, he was captured by the Russians, he was extradited to Poland, he was put on trial in Lodge, and he was hanged publicly. There, he is on trial over here. Now, the main reason why the Nazis wanted to uh, keep the Lodz ghetto is because the Rumkowski and the Jewish administration ran together with an iron fist. They even had a police force recruited from the Jewish underworld. This is a picture of how they were herded into the ghetto. This is a picture of a bridge that went over a street that belonged to the Polish sector. In the summer of 1942, the SS asked Rogowski for 10,000 children. So he made a speech in front of the uh, population of the ghetto. I'm paraphrasing. Give up your children. We're on the edge of extinction. If you know what I know, what I know, you can sleep at night. This way, I'm the only one who can't sleep at night. These were the trains that they were put into. No, those weren't the trains. Those were the trains into Auschwitz, sorry. The, until June of 1944, most of the Jews from uh, uh, Lodge were transported to an uh, extermination camp outside of Lodge, about a 30-minute train ride. It was called Helmno. And how they executed them was they could only handle 700 at a time. And they had 10 trucks that looked like this, 
Each one could handle 70 people. So there were 10 trucks that they would drive the trucks very slowly for approximately 15 minutes. And then they would open up the doors and bury everybody in mass graves. If there was anybody that was that not show any sign of life, they shot him in the head. It was called a Gnook shot, enough shot, you know, it was boom, done. Once they got to hell, no, there was a castle there that they were told that they would be transported to the east where they would have more food and jobs and, and all of that and to write postcards back to their relatives in the Lodge Ghetto that everything was nice and rosy. A few of those postcards got through. Hmm. Wrong way. <laughs> Maybe the right way. This was my father. He was born in 1914. He died in 1969 of cancer. I have a lot of pain when it comes to dealing with my father's memory. I would like to think that the main reason why he couldn't get close to me was because he lost his first wife and a four month old baby that went to Auschwitz with him and his wife was told if she gives up the child, she might live. She wouldn't give up the child, so straight into the gas chamber. And he went into some slave labor. This was my mother. She was in the Lodge Ghetto up to the end. She was randomly chosen with 699 other people, which made them a total of 700 people, to go through the apartments after the ghetto was liquidated and everybody was transported to Auschwitz, was to go through the apartments and to uh, salvage anything that could be used in Germany. Now think about this. These people were living in squalor, they had nothing, but the situation in Germany was so dire that they needed what they needed and they got it where they had to get it from. This is my sister. Her name is Helen. If you want to know who we are, we are called the second generation, G2. She is a perfect example. She's four years younger than I. She has very vague memories of Poland, very vague memories of Israel because we went from Poland to Israel to the United States. Her English has no accent whatsoever. It's like I've been here since 1958 and people still ask me, where are you originally from? <laughs> you know. So I always say, guess. It's the majority is from Eastern Europe or Germany. Close enough for me. Well, to give you an idea as to who we are, she graduated Queens College, not an Ivy League school by a long shot. She started with a company as a receptionist. That company became Lehman Brothers. At the age of 34, she was a senior vice president of, at Lehman Brothers. Do I need to say anything else? I don't think so. Now, I took a different path. What happened here? Huh? Okay. Now, there are two kinds of second generation. 
to the ones that were born in this country and the ones like me and my sister who were born overseas and then came to this country. Two different kinds of animal. The ones that were born here never experienced what we experienced. They never experienced being in a place where Jews were being murdered. They never experienced communism. They never experienced escaping from behind the Iron Curtain. They were born in the United States. They are Americans all the way. As for us, we had to become Americans. We were naturalized. 1964, I became an American citizen with my whole family. There's a joke about that, which has nothing to do with Jews. Would you like to hear it? <laughs> Uncle Mario, an Italian chap, chap, is about to become a citizen of the United States. So he walks into the courtroom with about 80 people with him. So the judge looks over his glasses and he says to him, sir, may I ask you, what is this entourage doing with you? Uncle Mario says, Your Honor, sir, this is at the proudest moment in my life. I'm becoming an American citizen. I brought my family, my friends, everybody. I, I, want, I want them to see this extraordinary event when I become an American citizen. So the, so the judge rolls his eyes, looks over his eyeglass, and he says, I will allow it as long as everybody's here, but before you become an American citizen, you have to take a little test on the history of the United States. Uncle Mario says, I am ready, Your Honor, sir. So the judge says, who was the first president of the United States? Uncle Mario says, George Washington. <laughs> the judge says, who was the 16th president of the United States? Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> the judge says, excellent, excellent, excellent. Then the judge says, who killed Abraham Lincoln? Uncle Mario says, that I don't know. So one of his nephews screams out from the audience, boy, Uncle Mario, don't tell him a damn thing, Uncle Mario. <laughs> so that, uh, what was I talking about before this joke? <laughs> Second generation. Yes. So that's who we are. But I took a different path. And not many, know, not many people know this about me, but here I am at the age of 27. I was the fastest gunslinger in the West. She was my girlfriend at the time. But anyway. But the issue with my father persists until this day. He never took me to a soccer game. He was unable to get close with me. He was unable to get close with my sister. He was unable to get close with anybody. He was consumed by what happened to him and his family. He had two brothers. Both of them were killed. One of them was caught smuggling food into the ghetto. So he was executed on the spot, and the other one, no one knows what, what happened to him. And his parents died of old age, disease, and starvation, and malnutrition, and all that. You know, it's, it was hard to tell because people just died, you know? So, anyways, so, so, uh, he. After Auschwitz, he was transported to a concentration camp outside of uh, Nuremberg called Flossenburg. Nasty place. And five days, four or five days before the U.S. Army liberated Nuremberg, the SS put 15,000 Jews on a death march. He was one of those. And uh, at the end, there was only about 3,000 left. Uh, but the commanding officer, he had a chance to have all of them killed because there was this uh, SS motorcycle with a sidecar with a machine gun on it who 
wanted to execute the remaining Jews on the death march. So this, this SS officer, who was the highest ranking officer of them all, said, nobody kills my Jews. My father and a few of the other guys that were on this death march tried to find him after the war in order to thank him. They didn't get very far. What they found out is that he was captured by the Russians and he was probably sent to one of those gulags in Siberia and he probably died there. But if it wasn't for nobody kills my Jews, I would be here talking to you right now. Now, in my previous talk, I also described that uh, I am here because of a decision that Hitler personally made. What happened after the uprising in the uh, Warsaw Ghetto, the Jewish uprising, there were two uprisings in Warsaw. One, 1943, which was the Jewish uprising, and 1944 was the Polish uprising. When the the SS had trouble putting down the uh, uprising in 1943 in the Jewish ghetto. They leveled the ghetto with artillery and from the air. There was nothing left of the Warsaw ghetto but rubble, but there was still resistance going on in the rubble. And the leader of, of the resistance was a 22-year-old by the name of Daniel Anielowitz with his girlfriend. And they got caught one day in the rubble and burned alive with a flamethrower. Now, to a person like me, that was a great death. To die in battle with your woman at your side and both of you die, so neither one will mourn the other. To me, that's a glorious death. As crazy as it may sound, with my background, that's what I feel. I didn't come here to fool you. I didn't come here to uh, be an academic, even though I could if I really wanted to. But it wouldn't be right, because I don't have a PhD. I should, though. <laughs> Maybe if I, I, I live another 25, 30 years, I may get one. <laughs> so uh, he was consumed by the war. When we came to the United States, he watched those black and white movies of World War II, where where German armies were being slaughtered, were, were losing the war. He th used to thrive on that. He, he lived on that vicariously. He was the only one that was left alive from his whole family. And I'm talking about his core family. We have cousins here, okay, who came to the United States right around World War I, and they lost contact with the Polish family. Well, anyway, the wife of one of them became interested in ancestry and, and she found us a year and a half ago. So all of a sudden we've got about eight, nine more cousins in the United States. Don't ask me to tell you how we are related to them. I can't get my head around it because my entire life, I believed, as we were told by our parents, that everybody was killed. But evidently, not everybody was killed, and I just can't wrap my head around that. They are all the children of these survivors, or the ones that came before World War II, they're all professional people. They all have college degrees. One of them is a doctor. Two of them are speech pathologists. My favorite cousin, who has enjoyed annoying me 
ever since I was 10 years old. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this you have to hear. His name is Irving. Not only that, but he grew up in Irvington, New Jersey. <laughs> Too Jewish. <laughs> Too Jewish, you know. That was supposed to be a Jewish joke. <laughs> but I suppose that what I'm talking about isn't putting you into a humorous mood, is it? There are also Auschwitz jokes. Would you like to hear an Auschwitz joke? Hmm? Yes? This elderly Jewish couple are on a tour of Auschwitz. And they get into an argument that has nothing to do with the trip or, or anything. It's just one of these arguments that married couples who've been married for 100 years get into. And they get so upset with each other that she's with the people in the front of the tour and he's with the people in the back of the tour and it takes about four or five hours and, and they go through Auschwitz and they go back to the bus and they sit next to each other and she turns to him and, and, and she says, I'm sorry, I overreacted. It was all my fault, I apologize. And he looks at her with anger. He says, now you're apologizing to me? Now you're saying you're sorry after you ruined Auschwitz for me? Now the Jewish people here are laughing at that joke. <laughs> you know, but uh, there are times that all we have left is humor. So what was my life like in Poland? <clears throat> after the war. I was born in 1948. I remember when Stalin died in 1953. I was persecuted. They used to call me all kinds of names. They would pick on me. I had a girlfriend in the first and second grade. We sat next to each other. Her name was Christina. I didn't realize it at the time because I was so young, but I was in love with her. I was, uh, how old was I? Maybe around six or seven years old, and I loved her. So uh, when the weather was good after school, I would ride my bicycle to her neighborhood, but her neighbors, those little boys that were her neighbors, started throwing rocks at me. Long distance, I would say. 30, 40 yards. Nice size rocks, too. <clears throat> so I threw rocks back at them. Did not realize at the time that I was exercising my pitching arm, you know, for Brooklyn. How did we escape from Poland? Well, let, let me go back a little bit. The main reason why we had to leave Poland is that my father's business was doing too good. So the communists had to shut it down. They broke into our apartment. They found US dollars. US dollars in the communist world was automatic five years in jail. So they took him away. And because we had money, he was able to get out. So he contacted his commanding officers from the past in the Polish army. And they paid people off, and we got the exit visa. So we ended up leaving Poland in 1956, in the fall of 1956. So it was by car from Lodz to Warsaw, by train to Bratislava, Czechoslovakia. We were stopped at, at the border. There were Russian troops on both sides of the train with AKs standing like this, like 10 meters apart on both sides of the train. And these two guys, like they look like the ones that we used to see in movies, like Gestapo guys with those long leather coats and, and, and they went from compartment to compartment on the train. 
they, they, they came to us, they asked my father, papers please, so he showed them the exit visa, then they, 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 so they said, uh, are these your children? He says, yes. Is this your baggage? He says, yes. Can we look through your baggage? Yes. After all of that was done, one of them says to my father, what's the matter? You don't like the communist world. I remember that as if it happened yesterday. And my father said, no, we are Jews. We want to go to Israel. And that was it. We probably stood there in the train for another half an hour to one hour. It was so long ago, so I, I can't really to tell you exactly how long it was. But what I can tell you is that the train moved forward, surged forward. And then it was the poof. And I looked at my mother's face and she went, And not long afterwards, we were in Vienna, Austria. The lights, the people, how they were dressed, it was the free world, the cars, blew my mind. I just looked around, my jaws dropped. Because Poland was very drab looking. You know, it was a communist country. They wanted it run the communist way. But here we are in Vienna, and I try eating a banana. This, this, this was the first time that I had a banana in my life. Boy, did I get sick. <laughs> so from Vienna, we took a flight into Athens. And Athens was hot. I was wearing... Uh, winter clothing, like a winter jacket, because it was late fall. And all of a sudden, it was hot. I took everything off. We took another aircraft to, to Israel. And as I said in my previous talk, we got lucky again, because we ended up in Israel right in the middle of the Sinai crisis, which was a, a kind of not really a war, but it was a a crisis which involved mainly Israel, France, and the United Kingdom. And we lived in Israel for almost two years. I learned Hebrew in about three months. And, and uh, that was when I began realizing who I was. In a, a child's mind still, you know. To get where I am at the age of 74 took a lot of work. I didn't get to where I am by, by just, by sheer chance. I'm not used to walking around in dress shoes. <laughs> this, is, this is one of the few opportunities that I have to get all dressed up in Crossville. I loved Israel. Everything was white. Uh, the economy was awful. There was a housing shortage, so we had to live with another family. And, and, but my heart was broken. Every night before I went to sleep, I would think about my Christina back in Poland. Until I met Aviva. <laughs> Oof, that hurts. <laughs> she was a beautiful girl. She was about 12 years old. I was, no, she was about, she was a little bit older than me. But she was from Yemen. And I had a crush on her. So, but my parents came to the conclusion that if we stayed in Israel, both my sister and I would have to go into the military at the age of 17. And they couldn't stand losing any more of their family members, so they decided to come to the United States. 
So we came to the United States. It was a long trip. It was an arduous trip. From Tel Aviv by car to Haifa, then in Haifa on an Italian passenger boat that was called the Pacha. And I was standing at the ship. I forget what you call the end of the ship. What is it called? The stern? And I watched Haifa fade in the distance, and I knew that I wouldn't be back there in a very long time. So I went to sleep, and the next morning I was awakened by low-flying aircraft. So I, I got dressed as quickly as I could, and, and I went outside. And it was British airplanes. It was not quite a civil war in Cyprus. This was Cyprus, okay? But it reached a point that the British had to intervene, so they had those old British Spitfires flying around from World War II. I didn't know at the time what those airplanes were, but as I got older, I, I got curious, so I began doing research what happened in Cyprus in 1958, you know? So then we continued through the Mediterranean. We approached Crete, which was very interesting to me because the waves that the, well, the ocean was very rough and the water was very dark. And I asked one of the, uh, crew members, why is the water so rough? Why is it so dark? And they said, because there are volcanoes, active volcanoes. Well, anyway, we ended up in Marseille, France, where we took a train to Paris. We stayed in Paris for a few days. And we had a very interesting incident happen to us in Paris. We were walking on the Champs-Élysées me, my mother, and my sister. And all of a sudden, there is this mob with French police on horseback with batons breaking people's head, bottles flying everywhere. It was demonstrations in regard to the uh, independence of Algeria. It was called OAS riots at the time. And they're coming at us. I would estimate it had to be between 500 and 1,000 people. Just coming at us, I could see blood on their faces. Their... And my mother freaked out and she, and she grabbed both of us. I almost forgot about, almost forgot about the microphone, didn't I? Uh, and it passed. I didn't feel anyone even brushing against me. It was unbelievable. They were gone. In retrospect, we were protected, wouldn't you say? So then the next day we took a train to Brussels where we boarded a Sabena Airlines, a propeller job. And we flew across the Atlantic and we had to refuel in uh, Greenland. And then we ended up in Idlewild International Airport, which became JFK. And here we are in the United States of America and we're living in the slums of Brooklyn. And all I hear is them bums, they left us, they went to L.A. They're talking about the, the Brooklyn Dodgers. <laughs> right? Despite everything that my parents went through, when we got to Brooklyn, they put me into a Jewish Orthodox Hasidic school. So I learned Judaism. 
translated the Old Testament from the ancient Hebrew into the modern Hebrew into the English with all the commentaries by the great rabbis, you know. And I went as far as the Gemara, which is like the Talmud almost. And then, of course, I came home one day and I said, Dan, get me out of this school. Put me into a public school. I want to see girls. Because <laughs> this was an old boys school. So I ended up in junior high school, 149, in East New York, Brooklyn. So if any of you have seen the movie Goodfellas, that was the neighborhood. Um, it was, in a way, a wonderful time in my life. Uh, we were all dirt poor there, all kinds. Jews, Italians, Irish, Germans. Immigrants from Castro's Cuba. We were all dirt poor, but we were a white enclave completely surrounded on one side by Afro-Americans and on the other side by Puerto Ricans. So we had West Side Story in East New York, Brooklyn. No. But at least there was honor among us. Yes, we were prejudiced, we were bigoted, we called each other all kinds of nasty names. But when, we got, when it came to a fight, when a man was down, it was over. There was honor among us. And I got into playing stickball. Do any of you remember what stickball is? Yes? Anyway, so... Where we lived was across from a high school football field. It was Thomas Jefferson High School, and it was walled off, high walls. I, I, I would say that the walls were about 10 feet high. And we borrowed ch chalk from school. Notice I said borrowed. And we drew a rectangle. And this is where we played stickball. And we aimed at the second floor window, the second one from the corner window. Why did we aim at that window? One of our friends lived there. <laughs> you know, and if you hit that little pink ball right, it could fly a long way. It could go 300 yards easy. So we were aiming at that window all the time. Kristen is looking at her watch. <laughs> uh, I had one glorious moment playing stickball. I actually was able to execute a Willie Mays catch with a pink ball, you know, those bouncy pink balls? Spaldings. I was running full speed towards the wall with my left hand out, looking backwards, looking back, did you, did you hear me? <laughs> looking backwards, and the ball just landed in my left hand, and I caught it. That was my proudest moment playing stickball in the United States of America. I su suppose that what I would like to conclude with is I have had to deal with this issue. I know a, a woman whose mother killed her father. Try living with that. You know. So we all have our crosses to bear. And to each of us, our, our cross is, is the worst. You know? I don't compare. I don't compare who, what is worse, because pain is pain. 
and the whole object of life, in my opinion, is what I have done. And I decided that I was going to be defiant. I was going to be a success. I was going to do what I want to do. I was, I will do what, I will live my dream no matter what happened in the past because the past is the past. I don't hate Germans. I don't hate Poles. I don't even hate Russians, especially now. <laughs> you know, I would like them to lose, but that's another story. But there are members in my family who will not buy a German car. I bought a German car. You wouldn't believe the trouble they gave me. You know what I'm talking about, right? Uh, and there are members in my family who uh, won't speak one word of Polish because there was a lot of anti-Semitism in Poland. And I keep on telling them, it's only a language. You're not in Poland anymore. And I have a few members of my family who speak German, but they won't speak one word of German. I tell them it's only a language. And I remind them that in the Jewish Old Testament, it says, the sins of the fathers shall not be visited upon the sons. And I have had contact with many Germans and many Arabs in the United States, and we all had a good laugh. You know why? Because we were laughing, especially those who are Arabs, and say, if we were back in the old country, we would try to kill each other, but here we're friends, and look, we're having dinner together. So, the United States of America, for the second time, has healed me. The people of this country have healed me. I have lived in the Northeast, in the Midwest, in California, and now I am in the great state of Tennessee in the metropolis of Crossville. And you know something, I feel comfortable everywhere in this country. You people, and I don't mean it, you people, you know, <laughs> Americans, you made this country. You helped me heal. Keep it that way. Stick to the ideals of our founding fathers, to democratic principles, to liberty and justice for all, all. There is no law that says that you have to like Jews. There is no law that says that you have to like blacks. But as a nation, everybody should be equal under the law. No matter what race, religion, what country we came from, we should all be equals under the law. And that is why I feel so comfortable in this country, even in the South. I watched the civil rights movement from up north, from New York City. I saw what was going on here. To be honest with you, I wouldn't have stepped one foot in the South until the 1990s. But now I'm living in the South. And I love the people in the South. I don't agree with them when it comes to certain things regarding politics, but this is a free country. They can say what they believe, and I can say what I believe. I, I, I can be who I want to be, and so, they, so can they. So this is a nation that was created to heal the downtrodden, like it says on the Statue of Liberty. It amazes me that there are people in New York City who have never been to the Statue of Liberty. It's unbelievable. There are people in this country who have never been to Washington, D.C. It's unbelievable. When, when, when I went to Washington, D.C., I felt like I was in a holy place. Keep it that way. 
I suppose that's all I have to say for now. If you have any, any questions, we have a few minutes left. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, ma'am. No. You're going to ask me why? For what it's worth, I think that the United States is the greatest country in the history of mankind. And I would like to be a part of it. Israel, it, as a Jew, it's very nice to have a country that will accept me in case anything bad starts happening to us anywhere else. It might even happen here. I doubt it, though. No regrets. Regrets? I have a few. Too few to mention. <laughs> Anybody else? The Jerusalem one? I've heard something about that. Well, and I think that it's about time. Well, I would like to see a copy of that. Re regarding the Ukraine, I'll make it real fast. The Ukraine was one of the most anti-Semitic countries in Eastern Europe. And now it is being led by a Jewish president who is leading them towards freedom. Now, uh, the story of those Ukrainian guards, there were a few, but the majority who, who were cruel, but the majority of them were cuts conscripted are, are you talking about now are are you talking about now look uh, that is a topic unto itself that would require another hour but uh my topic is done. So if you have any more questions, I, I'll be glad to answer them. Thank you. I think our uh, microphone wasn't working too well. Because you did all you could, but it kept going in and out. So I apologize for that. Did everybody hear me? I could hear you, but my ears are good. <laughs> I could hear me too, but I wasn't listening to myself. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you very much for coming.